Thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for getting here bright and early. It sounds like you've had a great few days. I'm very pleased I wasn't here yesterday when uh, on Ollie was here, because I think he's absolutely spectacular, and I wouldn't want to follow him. So I think you would have learned a great deal from him. I'm going to get today into um, uh, more of the nitty gritty and specifically looking at angel investment. Um, my background is as an entrepreneur. So I was a tech entrepreneur. I started a company called Omega Logic back in 1999. And we launched uh, mobile phone top ups into uh, Britain. We had we spent the first 18 months, two years building the tech and trying to raise funding. And we did get uh, quite a bit of angel money, about 600,000 pounds, which at, in the day was, was quite enough to, to get us going. Um, but then it was quite difficult to build tech and to get customers and to get the network operators in those days to agree to take on our technology. So I think for the first two years, I woke up every day thinking that I'd lost all of that money and all of my uh, life savings and what have you. But thankfully, with good technology and good customers, O2 was my, uh, my first customer. And uh, we, in the first year, we had about a million pounds of sales. So we began to get, get things building. And then uh, within a couple of years, it had risen to um, 88 million pounds. And by year five, it was 448 million pounds. So that, to me, taught me two things. One, the power of technology, the power of the ability of really great technology to be able to actually massively scale things. We had 12 staff, and we were generating those kind of numbers. And the second thing it taught me is that um, you don't need to go to VCs if, if you don't want to. We, we did that all off the back of angel funding. So we just had angels, and they got the full exit. So um, I went from, from that and obviously sold that company, and then I turned to angel investing myself. So I've been investing now for um, eight or nine years, um, done many, many deals, lots of companies, obviously with a tech focus, and um, have learned along the way what it's like being on the other side of the table. So don't ask me which one I prefer, entrepreneurship or investing. They've both got their, uh, both got their benefits. So uh, first of all, I'm so what we're going to do this morning, I'm going to talk about half an hour maybe, just about some things that I've learned about what you guys may want to think about when actually trying to find your angel. Some of this you may know, uh, may not, hopefully a few good pointers to get you started. And then we'll have a session of Q&A, so store up all those questions for me. I'll then spend another 15 or 20 minutes just talking about the pragmatics of the process. So once you've actually found an angel to invest in your company, how do you really work with that angel to make sure that you get their money in your bank account to build your business? Bit more Q&A. Maybe we'll have time for some pitches, hopefully. So a bit Dragon's Den style, if someone wants to come up and actually do a pitch to me for me to critique, if you'd like to do that, I'd love to do that. I'm much, much nicer than the dragon, so don't worry too much. I'll be very friendly. Um, and then, of course, being joined by Simon from um, DJ Esprit. OK, so when finding an angel, first of all, I think that you've got to think about whether or not angel investment is the right type of money for your startup. So if you are a pure startup, if you're just getting off the blocks and you're just building your tech and you're just forming your team and just beginning to talk to your customers, you're probably not quite ready for angels yet. These kind of businesses, we as angels, we look to make sure that you've put some money in yourself, that your life savings have been invested into your company, and that you've got some skin in the game. We also look to see that maybe you've um, convinced a few of your friends and family to put some money in the game. These are great markers to us as angels. You know, if you haven't put your own money in and if you haven't been able to convince some of your friends and family to, it might make us a little bit wary about you know, how committed you might be to the project itself. There are also other things, other, other areas, other ways that you can get money. Of course, as a startup, you can get a startup loan. You might be able to get onto an accelerator program like Wira or what have you, and, or win a competition and get some funding and get some support that way. So that's not really, um, not really quite ready for angels yet. But hopefully, you'll get all that very quickly. You'll get some traction behind you, and then you will be moving into the, the, the zone of angels. Angels. And what angels look for basically is traction. So we 
in all facets of your business. We like to see that there is a technology product, or if you're not an, um, a digital-based business, that obviously there is some manufactured prototype or something of some sort. We like to see that your team has been formed. We like to see that there is some traction on the sales side. So by that I mean that you have your sales channel sorted out, whether it's direct or through a channel partner or, or whatever, that you've got some clear idea on how you're actually going to get people to, to pay your money. Maybe you've got some revenue coming through. Um, all of these things, we, we like to see that you've actually got some traction and that you have a really clear idea now of what your business is and how you're actually going to, to plan to make it to profit and then make it to a big exit. Similarly, if you're, blast, you're already through that and you're blasting through and actually you've, you, you've been going for a while and you've got masses of traction and actually you need money for growth, again, you're probably not angel uh, money, you're probably, you probably are VCs. VCs in Britain in particular like to see that growth model, that's what they like to fund. So just make sure, first of all, a quick test that you are actually at the right stage of your business for um, angel investment. So um, when you look for an angel, I think the, the first thing that, that is really helpful is actually to think what type of angel you want. Who exactly do you want to give or sell a part of your company to? The first thing I think that you should think about is the, uh, the, the stage of business that you're at, the sector you're in, and the experience you need. So if you're a team of techies and you've got a product, like a consumer product that you're building, you may want to ensure that you get an angel on board that has masses of, of consumer experience in that sector. Seems obvious, but we do have a tendency as humans to attract people into our companies that are like us. So I've often gone into companies and seen a couple of great tech founders with a non-exec director who's also used to you know, be CTO somewhere and a CIO from somewhere else. And, and that's great, but actually it's, it's not really hugely additive to the business as a whole. What's great is where you can try to get an angel that complements your skills, does have sector experience, or maybe they have a Rolodex that, that, uh, that is, is what you need. And obviously angels often have that. You want to be able to get an angel into your company that brings money and contacts. And actually that's really important when you're beginning to talk to angels further down the process, that you ask them if they would be willing and able to open up their contacts list to you. That's, that's a really good test of, of what they feel about you and whether you can access all their great contacts to get your business going. Um, I think it's also important to think about whether you want to syndicate a group of angels or an individual. Um, these days, the trends are that um, angels are investing about 25K to 50K each per round possible, I'd say probable, therefore, that you may need a syndicate if you're investing, if you need more money than that, and most businesses do, you'll want a syndicate. And I think the ideal number is something between the order of three to five, maybe three to six angels coming together, all investing similar money, you know, 25, 45K, something like that, all coming together and investing in your company. If you have too many angels, if you have 15 or 20 angels in one syndicate, that is an awful lot of time that you need to invest in all of those individual relationships. It's, it really gets tricky. Don't underestimate how much time you will spend on the phone talking to these guys and giving them bits of information and making them feel good about you and good about the prospects for your company. So less is better. Um, Probably a bit, you might get one angel do the full round. There are some super angels which are coming onto the scene now, uh, and that's great. However, again, I would caution that if you have one great, very, very rich angel doing your full round, again, be careful, because what happens if they suddenly don't like your strategy, or if they decide that they don't like your latest business plan, or something goes a bit wrong and you know we know how business works we all have our ups and downs so be careful just having one investor because if he or she doesn't agree with what you plan to do with the company you might find yourself in a difficult situation so think about how many you want think about what involvement you want them to have 
Some angels will really want to get involved in your company. They know your sector, they like you, they're excited by the product. They may want to really get involved. They may want nine o'clock coffee every uh, Monday in Shoreditch and an update on Friday afternoon on sales numbers. And you really have to think about whether that's the kind of involvement that you're looking for. And equally, others will just go, no, you know, we trust you, we read the plan, here's the cash. Just give me an annual update or a six-monthly update, that's fine. Again, just think about what you think will work for you, what skills you lack, how much involvement you would need. Probably the balance might be somewhere in the middle. And it will be different for every angel. So if you have a syndicate coming in, you might decide that you want one lead investor representing that group. And that person you might meet with every fortnight for coffee or once a month for coffee and you catch up and you have some dialogue and some relationship with, but the others you just leave at arm's length. So give that some thought to. Uh, and finally, it is very much a two-way street. So because you guys need the money, uh, you'll be wanting to sell all the time to angels and get angels interested in your business. But you are selling one, possibly the most valuable thing that you have at the moment, which is the equity in your company. So I would stress that you need to do as much thinking about them and whether they're right for you that they do about them. Often it's the angels that give loads and loads and loads of questions to the entrepreneurs. You know, you should be doing the same back to them. Really question their, their uh, business history, their, um, uh, their experience with startups, with entrepreneurs, what they've done before in your sector. Really make sure that they really do fit you and your company well. Okay, so you've had a, had a think about what, um, what type of angel that you want to attract to your company, and now we need to think about where you're gonna find them. So in Britain, there is the UK Business Angels Association, and in Europe, there's EBAN, the European Business Angels Network. And if you go onto either of their websites, they will have lists of networks in your areas. This is the most common way to find angel investment. Go to the site find the network that's in your local area. They will have a pitching event once a month, <clears throat> twice a month, something like that. And what you need to do is you need to send your business plan into the network. Um, they may critique it, they may follow up with some questions, and then you get to pitch live to their 50 or 100 or 200 angels, and away you go. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the most common way to do it. I also point out informal networks. There is a growth at the moment of informal networks, um, and this is where we have angels who perhaps have syndicated in a deal before, enjoyed working with one another. They come together and decide, look, we've got quite a good deal flow ourselves. How about we meet once a month and just share deal flow? Now, if you can tap into informal networks like that, I would strongly advise that you, you, you find a way of doing so, because they can be very potent, because those networks Work, have worked together before, they know how to do deals and they can possibly do deals quickly. So when you do meet an angel, ask them if they are a member of an informal network or a formal network and try and find a route in there. The ways you can find them, the best way I think to find angels is through personal introduction. So go through your LinkedIn profile, find out who is connected to anybody else with the word angel in their job description or their title and see if you can f find a personal introduction. That is absolutely the best way. We angels get 20, 30, 40 business plans a week, a month, something like that. And it is sometimes very difficult as one individual person to keep up with that level of um, uh, deal flow with activity. But if I have somebody who I know and like and have worked with before, and if they come to me and say, you have to meet Adam, he's got this cool business, you've just got to meet him, I always will try and find a way of doing so. To, so do work the personal introductions. Social, of course, I mean, Twitter obviously has changed everything. Facebook, not so much, I don't think, at least not in Britain. I have never uh, used Facebook for um, angel investing, but Twitter is, the, you know, very quickly by doing a quick search on Twitter of angels in your country, you will find a lot and start following them and obviously start, you know, tweeting them or retweeting them or asking them questions and see if you can get some engagement there. That might be a way. Uh, and the final thing is that angels are everywhere. 
there are very, very few of them that will stand on a stage on a Thursday morning like me and say, hey, I'm an angel. <laughs> Most of them won't come out and tell you. They are high net worth individuals. Uh, they probably you know, may, may not want to tell you that straight up. But wherever you are, if it's at a party on a Saturday night or at the pub on a Wednesday afternoon, well, hopefully not Wednesday afternoon because you're busy working, aren't you, because you're entrepreneurs, but wherever you are, you, you know, you might have an angel uh, near you or you might have somebody who knows an angel very well. And be very mindful of that because uh, the, these opportunities do you know, the, there is this great serendipity that can sometimes happen. I've had some great uh, deals emerge through totally serendipitous meetings that I wouldn't have predicted before. Okay, so uh, you know who you want, you know where to find them. So how do you actually go about getting the connection with the angel? I think the most important thing is preparation. I cannot tell you how many times I go to events. I go to events every two or three nights a week and the majority of entrepreneurs will come up to me totally unprepared. They'll see me and they'll think, right, I want to meet her. So they'll come straight for me and they'll launch into uh, a monologue about their business. They have not given any thought whatsoever to the main point they're trying to make to me how, what they're trying to communicate, how they might be trying to come across. And it's quite off-putting because entrepreneurs are very energetic <laughs> and they're very ambitious and I, that's great, but it's very difficult sometimes as an angel when you get these ambitious, energetic entrepreneurs fly at you and then just barrage you with information about their great company, about their fantastic opportunity. Be prepared because the next thing that happens, if they do pique my interest and I can, I can actually understand what it is that they are uh, pitching to me, the minute I start drilling them on questions, and remember, angels are very time constrained, so immediately we'll say, great, what's your sector? What traction do you have? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Often then the shutters come down because the person might have a deep understanding of, let's say, technology, but the minute I start to talk about numbers and the margin, the business case, they clearly aren't quite prepared for those questions. So be prepared. Here's a good example of how it really worked brilliantly for me last week. So I was on holidays at my house in uh, south of France and a friend emailed me and he, he said, and I, I'm a bit naughty actually because I do check my emails all the time. So a uh, friend emailed me and said, look, you've got to see uh, this entrepreneur. I know you met her a couple of years ago. She's doing a quick fundraising, needs to close by the end of September. Can you just talk to her? personal introduction, you see. I knew this guy, I dealt with him before. And I said, yeah, yeah, fine. Look, can you just ask Sanchita to send me through the last six months of sales numbers, gross profit, run rate, how much cash she has in the bank, what contracts she's got, what her sales pipeline is, and what a technology roadmap looks like. Quick email. Five minutes later, Stephen came back and said, okay, I forwarded that email on to Sanchita. Six minutes later, six minutes later, Sanchita came back and Drill, just drop that information straight in. Our revenue last month was 93,000. July was 86,000. June, bang, 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 bang. This is our technology roadmap. This is our marketing plan. It was all, I couldn't believe it, it was amazing. That woman was totally prepped. She was in the zone for fundraising. She knew the kind of questions that I was likely to ask and she just had them to hand. That's really very, very powerful. So first thing, I can't stress it enough, is preparation. The next thing is courtesy. So, again, angels are high net worth individuals, but if they are out there at networking events or at events where they're meeting entrepreneurs, they do want to meet you. They are there to meet you. So in some sense, they're fair game, but please be courteous. I cannot tell you again how many times people have just been plain rude. So I, for example, someone has said to me recently, I was talking about uh, his company and, and what, what he would invest in it and, and what he was looking for from the angels. And he said to me, but it doesn't really matter if you lose all your money in this deal because you're rich. And I thought, no, <laughs> it matters to me a lot because we have a choice. Angels can sit at home or go to the golf course or go and have coffee or spend more money on 
sailing or skiing or actually, you know, we have that choice. But we're choosing to put our own money into your companies. It's our own money. We're choosing to do that. We're choosing to put that at risk. Just as you are choosing to risk everything, really, sometimes it feels like, doesn't it? Everything in building your company. So just be a little bit courteous and be a bit respectful, I would say. Um, and this does come on to first impressions again. So that, that I think, did you do yesterday a little piece on the elevator pitch? The first impressions are overwhelmingly important. And again, nine out of 10 times when somebody comes up to me, they will say, hi, I'm building a blah, blah, blah. And I always stop them and say, great, what's your name? And what's the name of your company? So again, just tone it down a bit, your name, because really all you want to get across in that first 30 seconds when you meet someone is you're normal, <laughs> you know, I want to know your name, that you're, some, you're quite normal, but you've got a great ambition and, and you're a nice person. If you can try and get those impressions across, that's all you need to do. Everything else can come later through the conversation. But in saying that, it is helpful to stand out. Now, the ways in which you can stand out are many, but be a bit careful. This is where I think you have to understand who your audience is. So you have to think about your angel and think about whether it is right to stand out. But I think you know what I mean. Maybe this is a bit about charisma. You do want to be memorable, but not too quirky. So by all means, just make sure that we as angels understand your product, that we get you, that we're, we're clear about you. And um, just be, be very courteous. Ways in which you can stand out are in the way in which you impress upon us angels what it is that you're about. So for example, I mentioned sampling here. And uh, um, if you are in uh, a business where you are actually producing something, sampling or, or giving the angel a sample of your product is a great way of actually building some connection. But the same goes for tech. Again, so many times tech entrepreneurs will come to me and say, look, I've built this great prototype and it's in you know, private beta and it's actually flying, it's going wonderfully. We'll have a nice conversation and they'll walk away and I think, why didn't you offer me a, a login? Why didn't you send me the next day by email um, a link to, to get into the private beta so I could play around with it? So you've got to find a way of, of getting that connection with the angel. So... Um, uh, Sampling is a great way of doing it. Um, recently, I was sent a letter. It's difficult to find my address. So they went on company's house. I'm a board member of a number of organizations. They found one of the companies that I was a board member on and sent me a letter to that company, knowing that it would eventually find its way back to me, which it did. But it was a beautifully written letter on you know, um, bright paper or so something really stood out about it. I thought, well, that's really cool. I get you know, 100, 100 plus emails a day. Someone's taken the effort to find out how to reach me and handwritten this beautiful letter, extremely politely, real cool, just lovely. I thought, that's great, great way of standing out. I have also received, I have to say, boxes of chocolates and all sorts of things. Someone found out that I have, I've got three sons, so they, and they were in the food business, so they send me this pack of um, food that they, they uh, make, which they know kids like. And I thought, well, how cool is that? That's just, you know, they're knowing who I am. They've found out a little bit about me, and they're trying to make a connection. I thought that was really cool. Okay, I've got a couple of examples here of pitches I've received recently which didn't work, okay? So, that's the first one. That's an email I got. Do they re... I mean, so they haven't, they haven't got my personal email, they've gone through LinkedIn, they've sent me a LinkedIn request, and that was the email. Do they really honestly think that I'm going to reply to that and say, great, love to hear from you. I'd love to spend my money on that. It's concise, I give it that, but it's, it's really very difficult for me to get excited about something like that. Maybe I'm just a spelling and grammar nut, but you know, again, show some respect. Here's another one. This, is, this email went on forever. 
I added the blah, blah, blah at the end because it was a page long. I didn't want to completely fill up the screen. But, but I get this again all the time. You know, he's working on a new site. It's really exciting. It's going to change the world. That's lovely, but all that kind of, that's hyperbole. It, it's dramatization. It doesn't really help me understand what the business is about. It's not a terribly effective email. The most effective emails are when you've researched the angel, you know they invest in your sector. You can find that out. And you know that they, um, you know, that they, they like your, your vertical or what have you. And then you email and say, say you know, I've, I've heard about you because of the deal you did here. I've got a company in a similar sector. It would fit really well as a portfolio strategy or whatever. This is the traction we've got so far. We've got this of revenue and that of you know, burn or whatever. I would really like the chance to send my executive summary through to you. Perfect. You've researched what they want. You've worked out why you would be relevant to them and you've connected. There is one other place. I've received pitches absolutely everywhere, but the worst one I ever got was here. So I literally did a gig like this, came off stage, someone put a bottle of water in my hand, it's great, and I raced off to the loo, and the entrepreneur chased me down the hall. <laughs> and then, she, and then she, she started to talk to me, and I was still walking like this, and then I went you know, in through the door, and she still followed me, and she was still talking, and I thought, well, that's, you know, just hang on a second, just let me have some space. So again, probably not in that environment. Okay. So, we're going to talk now about what I think angels are looking for today. Okay, so it's pretty obvious, but angels want big opportunities generally. They want an opportunity that can on average, tenfold their money, and they want something that's going to change or disrupt their sector. You know these things. You've probably heard about this all the time: disintermediation and mediation and disruption, and all of these great words. Um, but there is also a very, very important part of the market for investment, which is the small companies, the traditional, and the more predictable. There is a balance here on risk. The first side is great, and we as humans tend to go to the left-hand side, because that is new, and no one's going to talk to their mates at the golf club on Saturday night and say, guess what, I've just spent 100 grand investing in a really small company that's got some technology that was invented in 1940, but I'm sure it's going to be fine. That's not very exciting. So we do tend to the left-hand side, but don't underestimate the power of the small, traditional, and predictable. Because what we, we, we do need to, to try to find ways of de-risking things. Now, for example, in Britain, some research was released recently which said that the, the most popular areas of angel investing in Britain at the moment are, number one, the internet, then followed by consumer, and then media and ICT. I know they're very broad, generic kind of categories. But if you're in those categories, internet was, was huge in comparison with everybody else, media, consumer, and ICT. The least popular were business services, manufacturing, and mobile. Interestingly, I thought that was quite interesting. I know, I did that as well. I had a mobile business. I like waving the flag for mobile tech. but. Um, the, the important thing to remember is the, multi multitude, the multiple of difference. So yes, internet was an outlier that got a lot of investment in Britain, but business services manufacturing and mobile were still getting lots of investment. So they were, maybe for every three consumer or media deals, there was only one mobile or business services deal, but still there were deals going on in those sectors. So there is a lot of money out there. Um, in Europe, angel investing is generally increasing anyway. In Britain, the government are doing lot, a lot to underpin angel investing. So the whole sector is rising. So be careful about just knowing where you sit on this spectrum, both in terms of the sector and in terms of these kind of risk profiles. Big, new, and exciting is great, but don't, you know, if you're not you know, new and exciting, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Okay, 
So when you find an angel, we're going to talk now about what it is they're looking for. So we've talked about market potential. They do typically like big markets. What they really like is high growth. So um, again, there is money out there if you've got a steady state business with reliable earnings and you need some working capital. There are opportunities like that that an angel would invest in. However, we do prefer the high growth stuff. We like good margins. So if you have, this is why technology is always fabulous because the margins are so stonking, aren't they? But whatever business that you have, if you have good solid margins, then you know, put that out loud and proud at the front of your case because that does really make a business hum. Did you see the Wonka results yesterday? Did anyone see those Wonka results? Oh my God. So do you know what Wonka is? It's, like it's the payday lender. So if you are running short at the end of the month or end of the week, you can go to Wonga and you can get uh, a consumer loan. So a big business, it's listed in Britain. They made 85 million pounds of profit. Profit. Um, they are, they, it, it's incredible. Businesses like that, that's a, probably quite a controversial business to talk about, but you can get businesses with technology. That, that whole business runs on algorithms. So when someone comes onto their site and applies for a loan, you know, the algorithms run in the background to see if you are uh, the right kind of person they want to lend to. It's just tech that runs that organization, and that's why they've got, got huge profits. So profits, uh, margins, obviously that's really important. Another thing I think is important is whether or not the angel gets it. So again, um, entrepreneurs, we get very excited, don't we, about our companies, and we know everything about it, and we've lived it and breathed it from day one. And when we're pitching to angels, you know, we tend to go into a lot of detail, and we want to tell the, tell the angel about this and that, and don't forget about this, and what about this opportunity, and of course there could be this over there. Sometimes angels get lost with all of that, so an angel really needs to get it and feel, I think, instinctively that they would be a customer, of you or they would buy your product or they could see that that one of their businesses or one of their peers would buy the product. Um, is it deliverable? There is a world of difference between a great idea and a business, making it into a, a business. We really have to, un have to believe that the plan that we're being presented with is actually possible to be delivered that it actually looks like you can get your head, arms around and go, yes, I can see that they can get that marketing plan working and they can get that IT developed and they can hire those key staff and, and actually all pull it together. That's really important. I think I've used this word a number of times already this morning, but I'm gonna stress it again. We look for traction, traction, traction in any area, you know, um, any subscriber numbers, revenue, anything that you can show that you're actually getting some real stickiness and, and a lot of people really buzzy and excited about using your product. And then of course there's the team. Now, um, I'll the team is obviously very important because it's you guys that are going to be building the company. And no matter what we angels think of the opportunity or the business plan or the margins, we are reliant on you as executives to execute the plan. So the team is absolutely vital, extremely vital. There were, there's many, many things I look for. I do look for you know, the personal attributes. I look for resilience and I look for um, high achievers. I really like high achievers. People that have, can show me, I've got one person in my portfolio and she was um, a US elite gymnast when she was 12. And I think, yeah, that, I want her. She also speaks um, you know, Cantonese and Mandarin and German. And it's like, yeah, okay, I'm, <laughs> she's great already. She's got an MBA. She does everything that she's applied herself to. She just rocks. That is a brilliant entrepreneur to get behind because she has such perseverance and such hard work. So anything that you have in your private life or in your education and your schooling that can point to where you've really overachieved, I'd let the angel know that. That's really important. Um, charisma, I do think, is important, especially for the CEO, because, and obviously for the sales and marketing person, because you are going to have to sell your company every day. Um, you know, you're going to be selling all the time to potential hires, to potential customers, to potential suppliers, to everybody. So your personal charisma is very, very important. Um, and I do also prefer personally to invest in teams 
rather than individual entrepreneurs. I have invested in individual entrepreneurs in the past, but I think that what makes great entrepreneurs great, you know, that thing that makes you work harder than everybody else and makes you persevere and makes you really, really run hard when everybody else just wants to go home, that's weird. That's not normal. Normal people don't have that. I think entrepreneurs are quite quirky and I think they're often a bit broken. And I think what that, ha what me what that means is that if you've got one single entrepreneur running a company and, and we are a bit quirky, we are a bit crazy and a bit loopy, when we're on the up, it's great. But if we're on a down, then things can be a little unstable. And that's why I prefer teams of two or more in the hope that there can be some balance in the team. So if I'm down today, because I'm a bit loopy, then my co-founder can help raise me up. Does that resonate with any of you? We've got some other loopy people in the audience. That's tremendous. So uh, I look for a team. Now, the other thing I haven't mentioned here is valuation. I should have put that first on the slide. So write that down. Valuation is an art, it's not a science, but at the end of the day, you are selling shares in your company for a price. So when I look at opportunities, I have to feel that, that it is the right price. And that's super important as well. I have got uh, pitch decks from great teams, great ideas, great plans, and they'll say in their first seed round that their pre-money valuation is 23 million pounds. And I'll just think, well, actually, no. <laughs> you know, that doesn't really make any sense whatsoever. I know that you're in the social space and you think that you're going to be the next Facebook, but, you know, come on, that's just a bit too much. So valuation is important. It is, after all, um, a financial transaction. Okay, so that's, that's all you need. That's quite easy. There is another way to cut this slide that other angels may think is more important, and it's this. So there is another growing consensus of opinion, which says that kind of the, the plan, the product, the opportunity is all very well, the margins, the business case, great, but actually, if you don't have a killer team, you're not going to go anywhere. And I have to say that on balance, if I have two um, investment opportunities on my desk, and I can only do one, and one has a brilliant business plan and a great product, but a bit of a rubbish team, and the other one has a brilliant team, but I'm actually not quite sure about the product, I will always go with the team. So don't underestimate the importance of making sure you've got the right people around you. And also, if you are already in a team and you already are concerned about how that team's working or you know, working together, then you need to get it resolved now. Be assertive, have the conversation, discuss it with your co-founders. If you don't have the right skills, if someone's not pulling their weight, sort it out now. Because what will happen, and I have seen this so many times, is the investment comes in, you may get the investment if you're lucky, and then within the first quarter, everything will blow up. Everything always blows up in the first quarter. The first board meeting after an investment goes really well, the second and third are a nightmare. Because these issues, if they're not dealt with, as soon as you get the extra stress of external investment into your company, that positive stress, that positive money that needs to be spent and invested on building your company, that comes with it responsibilities. So do try to deal with that now. Okay, just a final few points before we'll turn it over to you guys for questions. Uh, I mentioned earlier it's important that you do as much due diligence on the angels as they do as you. Um, Tom Hume, one of my co-investors, a fantastic angel if you ever get a chance to meet him. He talks about three different angel types. Dumb angels who know they're dumb. Smart angels who know they're smart. And of course the third type, dumb angels who think they're smart. There are a lot of each of the three types out there. And I'll be the first one to put my hand up and say I'm, in the, I'm a dumb angel when it comes to med tech and clean tech. I really am dumb. I've made some investments in that area. I don't know it. I'm not going to do any more. Uh, and I know that. You really need to try to avoid the third type, though. Those, those angels that are out there that are investing because of ego or because it looks a bit fun and maybe it's something to do, maybe they uh, just want to get involved in the scene. But if they don't know your sector and they don't really understand your plan, it can be very, very dangerous. 
Okay, finally, uh, tax in Britain is a major driver. Uh, some research came out recently that said that 74% of angels say that tax is a, a highly significant or very significant factor in their decision making to invest. So the tax breaks that we get in Britain in particular are really influencing behaviours on investment. Be concise every time. Think of the five W's. That's not quite correct. It's you know, who, what, where, when, and how. I know that's an H. But do always think when you're p pitching at every, every stage. Be concise and really think about how you're pitching your product. Be very, very clear and sell. Every opportunity you have in front of other business um, people is an opportunity to, to sell. Have you done sales training? Do you know that thing um, with him? You always think of the word of the acronym with him engraved upon the forehead of your other person, W-I-F-M, which stands for what's in it for me. When you're pitching to someone, you're pitching to an angel, always think what's in it for them? Why would they in want to invest in you? Why now? Why you? They get 100 opportunities a month. So really think, you know, is this something that they know about? Is this the best opportunity in the world? Why? Really think about why you, why now? Okay, so I'm going to have a sip of water. Don't worry, I'm not running to the loo. And uh, I'd love to have a first question. Not like you to ask questions, sir. Um, you said that you um, only um, invest in a business that already has, as you said, traction and sales. And have you ever invested in a proposition that isn't quite there yet? Mm. It's probably at the... Um, I don't know, the incubator seed. or acceler seed stage. Yep. Uh, it's, in other words, it's a strong and compelling idea. You can see its um, future, especially if it's in a, uh, an industry that you have a background in. Yeah. Um, in other words, so it, yeah. well, I guess the answer is, the question is, would you ever invest in a business? Like yes, that? yes, 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 yes. Um, uh, what you need for seed investments are investors that understand the seed opportunity is different to an opportunity that has some traction behind it. I'll give you some stats though. Um, in Britain, again, I'm sorry this is so British based, it is the research report that was most recently published. I apologize to, uh, to um, other European entrepreneurs here, but 23% of investments made in the last two years have been in seed uh, stages, 14 in very early startup and 53% in early stage, which is businesses that do have the traction. So there's actually a lot of money that's going in seed and very early startup, um, maybe a factor of one to, to two. So yes, uh, I, but as I say, you have, to, you have to pitch it differently. The risk is higher, and obviously that needs to be reflected in your valuation. So the risk is higher, valuation lower, but if you've got the angel that understands your sector, it's definitely still a great opportunity. Sorry, Dale, obviously it varies from from case to case, but in that seed sort of moment, I often think to myself, in terms of someone investing in my idea, which is still very much an idea as a seed concept, how much equity should you kind of be looking, you know, a sort of upper limit go to? Um, I know it's a it's tough a question. It's a million dollar question, isn't it? This is, this is the most common question, again, from entrepreneurs. How much money am I worth? What's my business worth? Um, it is tricky. I would say that at the moment, seed opportunities are always priced sub-million and often around the half mark. And I, I kind of, I mean, again, it's very much an art, not a science, but I almost, I kind of look at a seed opportunity at about worth about half a million, and then I add and subtract. So if you've got a rocking team, if you've got somebody in your team who's done this before and had an exit and got a bit of you know, money in their back pocket, you've really got some great people on the team, I'll, I might push the evaluation a bit higher. If you have anything from anybody which suggests that the product is going to sell or that the subscribers are going to really escalate quite quickly, then I might add a bit more. But um, that just gives a rough idea, I would think. Yeah. Um, given that today's focus is on women, um, I just wondered if there are any is it? particular. Yes. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's uh, there we go. That's why I've been invited. <laughs> um, just wondering if there are any particular challenges and also opportunities that you c you've sort of 
as a woman in this space? As an entrepreneur or yeah. an investor? Entrepreneur. Oh, God. Um, you know, not really. I think that, um, to be honest, I never even thought, uh, I didn't really th think that much about being a woman. I was like, I, I, I had a, I was a, an entrepreneur, I had a technology, I had an idea, I had a vision. I didn't give a shit what gender I was. I don't think anybody else did too. I honestly didn't think about it. It, it probably struck other people more than it struck me. But I, I think it's given a little bit too much airtime. You just barrel on ahead, don't you? You just write a plan, get some great people, get some meetings, sell, 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 pitch, pitch, pitch for years and years and years until finally you make it. I mean, honestly, I don't, I, I'm sorry. I, I think... The only thing I would say is that one of my best friends is an entrepreneur as well who also exited very successfully. We both got three kids. I've got three boys. She's got three daughters. I'm not quite sure which is luckier. And um, she had her children as she was growing her business. I had my children right after I sold my company. And I don't think as a woman I could have had my children while growing a company. I made an absolute positive choice to forget about kids until my company was completely rock solid and, and totally profitable. She did the other way and she had, you know, almost like 18 hour a day care for, your, for her kids so that she could travel around the world and build her company. But she, her children are cool. They haven't suffered at all. So I couldn't have done what she did though. That's the only thing I would say. I wouldn't focus too much on the gender issue. Focus on the, the, that you've got a great company to build. Hi Dale. Um, Hi. Ben Miles, Imperial College. Um, I was wondering, what's your favourite way to see traction? Do you have anything um, from, from your past? That you I think it d depends on the business. I mean, of most of the businesses I'm invested in, it's about subscriber numbers, it's about customer numbers, it's about... But it's, it's all those kind of... It's the, it's the metrics that underpin the business model. You know, your average lifetime value, the cost of acquisition, all of these metrics which underpin your assumptions and your plan of how you're going to make money. But also it's very difficult when someone comes up to me and says, look, I've been working at this for two or three years. Uh, I'm going really well and, I was, and, I, and it, we're planning to get there. And I, you know, and I say, great, how many paying subscribers have you got? And, I got, and they'll say, I've got 2,316. And I think, well, that's not enough, you know, obviously. So subscriber numbers, definitely. And the, and the number has to be big. It, it has to be big. If you have been working at something for two or three or four years and it's still a, a low number, I really, that's when you need to get out that lean startup book and learn about pivoting, I would suggest. So subscriber numbers, obviously, if it's a product business, then really it's about, you know, orders, quantity, um, sales. Um, but yeah, mainly traction around, the, it's, it's about the customer, that where the sales are going to come from. That's what's important. Thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, have you got any recommendations to how to come up with a sensible valuation? I appreciate it's, it's a nuanced question, but... Um, there, are, there are a number of ways that you can do this, and uh, there perhaps could be another whole half-day session on valuation. There is the discounted um, NPV model, so ask any MBA how to, you know, to take your uh, financial projections and then discount them back. Obviously, that's one way of doing it. Um, I think actually the valuation is what someone's prepared to pay, right? You know that old adage. You really have to get out there and talk to people. I wouldn't lock down your valuation until you've spoken to your other entrepreneurs that you know, friends. Um, I, I'd talk to everybody. I'd go on Companies House or Due Deal and uh, have a look at all of the other companies who are developing similar businesses and look at what their valuations were. You can do that through the share and subscription tables. You can compute it back. You can work it back mathematically. So um, do, do your research. Um, speak to people and then start testing it with angels. You can tell pretty quickly because if, the, if you say, "Look, I'm thinking about you know seven or eight hundred thousand pre-money," you, you you'll get a response pretty quickly. I think. I know it's not ideal, but it, it, there's, there's no great way to do it. Oh, I would say just one thing on valuation. Once you've come up with a rough figure. 
then work it forward, chunk it forward. So by that I mean, let's say you're going to give up 10% equity now to your investors, but then you know you're going to have a Series A round in two years' time, and you anticipate that in that round you're going to give up a further 10%, and then you expect that you're going to exit another three years at a certain PE multiple. You need to run the math to work out that the investors here even with the dilution, can still get 10 times their money. So you still have to work out that at every stage of the game, there's enough money in it for everybody. Because there will be angels out there who, who might say to you, look, the reason that I'm investing is because I'm giving something back to the startup community, and I love entrepreneurs, and it's great fun, and it's really interesting. But really, I mean, they're putting their money into your company because they want a whole lot back. So work that one out too. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, I know it is again very British focus, but the SEIS stuff and how that's yeah. changed how you can approach angel investors. Yeah, so um, the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme it is an almost unbelievably generous scheme for British based companies. So if you have a British incorporated company, you don't have to be British, but if your company is incorporated in Great Britain, uh, then you can get up to £150,000 of investment into your company and your investors get immediately 50, 5 0, 50 percent of that back through their uh, offset against their tax in that year. Uh, so it's extremely generous. The normal enterprise investment scheme, the EIS scheme, is 30%. This one is capped at 150 grand per investment, but is at 50%. So very, very generous. It has been skewing investment in Britain in the last 12 to 18 months. So what we have seen, and it was shown in those figures where 23%, I said 23% of investment went into seed companies, it wouldn't have been that two years ago. But angels are now looking at seed companies and thinking, well, okay, I'll put 30 grand into your business, I'll get 15 back on tax, so my risk is 15 grand, and you know we'll see how that plays out. So do maximize it if you can. Just Google C, you know, SEIS, you'll come up with the criteria. It, it might be something that could be really helpful for you. The tax, as I said, is, is highly important for angels in Britain, so very much make sure that you are utilizing all the tax breaks that are available to you. Hi. Hi, Dayo. My name's Linda, Hi, and Linda. I'm from See My Events. Um, now, what's your advice, really, for entrepreneurs that are um, sort of trying to build the A team? Because I guess from my uh, well, with my struggle is I'm trying to build a company, and it's sort of balancing that with the networking events. So, you, you know, how do you go about finding the A team? Hmm. Um. Maybe a bit of serendipity comes into this. I do, like Ollie Barrett, who you would have seen yesterday, I spend a lot of my time networking, and I tend to find that if I put myself in the right place often enough, good things will come of it. I will meet good people. So you do have to get out there. And you have to think, well, OK, I need a VP engineering. So I need to go to Silicon Drink About on a Friday. I need to go to these things and, or you know, campus party and, and find um, engineers. You, know, you need to think, go to where they go is what I would say. So target and focus your um, networking. But, but you do have to keep doing it. I do really get your point though about trying to build a company and balance it with the networking. I know that can be difficult and equally as an angel if I see um, an entrepreneur on the circuit too much at the drink about I'll be a little bit worried that they're not that focused on building their company. So but again intros going through LinkedIn ask 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 I don't think we're you know we can do a lot better I think by simply asking the question to uh, you know you, you'll have 100 200 business people that you know in your network and and ask them if they know someone with this skill set. You just have to get out there, ask the question, and uh, yeah, just try, try your best to balance it. I know, yeah, it's hard. Okay, sorry, one last question, <laughs> then we'll go into the next part of the process. Uh, going forward with the question about the team, um, there are uh, there is a thought about the, the same team that starts a company is not necessarily the best team to for the company in f five years, 10 years. Um, how much does it weight the, the, the evolution that the, the team, uh, sorry, uh, when you 
uh, look into a seed company or a company that is starting, uh, do you, do you think it's important that the same team is pre is going to be prepared in five years, or do you think it's imp uh, the most important is they are really prepared for the first year, second year? Okay, good question. I think it is very important that the founding entrepreneurs are flexible. And this trait, this personality trait, is often doesn't really correlate strongly with some of the other attributes that we normally see in entrepreneurs. But the reason why I say flexibility is because nine out of 10 companies, by the time they exit, will have a completely different management team. So we know this as investors. We anticipate that through the life cycle of the company, the founding directors will move on and other people will, will be brought in. What is really very, very helpful is to understand at the outset from the founding team members what their aspirations are what they believe their skill sets are, and whether and where they see their limits. So it's fantastic to meet an entrepreneur that says, I'm going to found this and grow it and build it and exit. That's absolutely brilliant if their attributes match their ambition. So when someone makes that statement, that's lovely, that's great, I love big ambition, but I need to know that they have run a business before or achieved an exit before or have the gumption and the strength to actually see that through. It's equally perfectly acceptable at the outset to say, I really want to grow this as far as I can, I want to learn it and develop, I haven't done some of the things I may need to, perhaps I could have a coach. And in fact, I didn't mention that, having a coach an exit coach in particular at the outset is extremely helpful. I would strongly recommend having a person on your board or somebody you might meet once a quarter whose job is to focus on the exit, only the exit, and to coach the CEO. Because the decisions that you take as you build your business, there always has to be someone thinking, is that going to work for a buyer? So just think of that as well. And equally as a management development thing, if you've got somebody in your team at the outset, a non-executive director or a chairman or whatever, who can coach you if there are, if you are concerned, then great. But flexibility, I would say, is most important. Okay. Right, I'm going to quickly run through some quick slides now on the pragmatics of the process. We talked a lot earlier about uh, finding the angel and uh, all that kind of stuff. Now we're going to run on to exactly what it is that you do. It's very, very simple. This is all you need to do. Now, you've been learning about pitches yesterday. You'll learn business plans tomorrow. This process will move around a bit, some stages will drop away, other people, other investors will have different stages in here, but I, it's, it's vital that you understand what is expected from you. Every entrepreneur comes to me and says, I need this much money and I'm going to close in six weeks time. And I'll go, great, that's fantastic. So you've already got all of the other investment lined up. Oh, no, 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 you're the first person we've spoken to. But I'm absolutely sure, they say, that I'm going to close in six weeks' time. I've seen it happen once in eight years where it closed in six weeks' time. There's always an expectation that we can do things quicker when it comes to the investment market. What you must understand, particularly with angels, is you are dealing with individuals. And remember we talked earlier that you're dealing with a syndicate, most likely, of individuals, three, four, five individuals. They have other calls on their time. Um, you want to keep the momentum going, you don't want to lose them, but you have to be mindful that you've got all these people with all these other things going on in their life and you have to pull them together. And I'm afraid it is like herding cats. Everyone hates the process. Everyone says it goes on too long. I completely agree. But what we're going to talk about now is ways in which you can make sure that you accelerate the process. Now, the best way of doing that is preparation. 
which we talked about earlier. So before you even do your first introduction, your first elevator pitch, your first pitch at all, honestly prepare 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 do not start talking to people until you you know start to like go home now and open a dropbox folder and call it due diligence and put in there your company secretarial records put in there any published financial accounts any recent management accounts any trademarks and patents that you have any legal agreements that you have things that you know are going to be asked for, dump it into the dd box do a business plan do your forecast make sure that your forecasts Try and do two or three years out if you can, two years at minimum. Do balance sheet and cash flow, not just profit and loss account. Write your business plan. Do all of this now before you start talking to people. Have it all ready. Don't spend a lot of time on it. Don't overcook it, but make sure that it's there so you're very, very clear. Then start doing your pictures and develop relationships. This is when you do go out and say, hi, Jake, I know that you're working in... Um, you know, in Shoreditch. I know there's a, some really cool angel networks around there. Do you know any of these guys on my list? Can you help me start to build relationships, start to target people, start nicely, nice way, uh, and start to, to get into your networks. Do your pitches as you went, went through yesterday. Get your business plan ready. The way it works is you do a pitch and then an angel says, I really like your business. That looks fantastic. Can I please now have your business plan? you go straight back to your office or your home and you send an email, lovely to meet you, can I please connect with you on LinkedIn, here's the business plan, if you have any questions, please email me, I'll follow up with you in four days time or, or, or something like that. So, you know, really get onto it, have it all there so you can just go back and be onto it. Because what, again, the reason there are big delays is angels will ask for information and it will take a while for the information to come back. Have it all to hand and you'll accelerate the process a lot quicker. You'll then probably get called in to do a second pitch. So they'll say, great, read the business plan, have a load of questions. That second pitch might be coffee, might be going through the whole presentation again. You might be presenting to the person's husband or wife or their mates or whatever, other investors, doesn't matter. Just do what you need to do. And at every meeting, be professional at the outset of the meeting say, this is the objective I have for this pitch meeting. This is what I'm hoping to get out of it. Can I clarify the objectives with you? Great, good. Do the meeting at the end, wrap up by asking, um, by summarizing the next steps, by summarizing any action items and agreeing what the outcome is going to be. So keep it professional, keep it tight. And that's the best way of moving the process along. Always agreeing the objectives at the start, agreeing the outcomes at the end. That helps enormously. Otherwise, angels, they can slip through your fingers. They'll just, you know, you'll, they'll, you'll never see them again. Um, due diligence, again, that Dropbox folder, every angel will have a different list of DD. Some will say, oh, I'm not worried about money, the finances, the model. I don't really care about tech, don't really understand it. I just want to see the marketing plan. Okay, we'll just give them the marketing plan. Some people will just want to talk. They'll just want to keep meeting you and trying to get under your skin and understand you personally. Some will want you to do some personality um, tests some occupational profiling questionnaires. Some will want you to do some team dynamic testing. It's becoming more um, prevalent these days. So do all that, whatever they want, just give it to them, keep it professional. And then of course you start getting into the legals. There are great uh, law firms out there now who wrap it all up into one package, fixed fee deal, you get your investment agreement, your subscription agreement, your articles, everything done and dusted. Do that, lock in a fixed fee, no surprises, get somebody else to handle it, get them to run through it. Um, sink or swim. When you get to the point where you've got your group of angels, you've done all the due diligence, you've got your legals, you're at five weeks and six days because you're fantastic entrepreneurs and you're going to prove me wrong by getting the money in within six weeks, you can still say no. They can still say no, but so can you. I did it once when I walked in to sign. So I had a... Um, I think it was half a million pound investment coming in. I had two and a half thousand pounds left in the bank account. I'd paid payroll the week before on my credit cards. I really needed that money. And I walked into the meeting room to sign the legals and to get the investment in. 
and the two guys uh, sat down, everything was all laid out, and they said, Dale, it's fantastic, company's looking really good, but you know, we know you're a bit short on cash, aren't you? And I said, yes, that's why I'm doing the investment. And they said, yeah, 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 that's fine. Well, we just decided, they said, that rather than valuing your company at three million pounds, we, we think that today we'll value it at one and a half million pounds. So I steeled myself and I said, actually, no. We agreed three million pounds. We entered into uh, negotiations in good faith on those terms. I am not happy that at the 11th hour, you are trying to screw me and I'm going to say no. One of the guys turned to me and said, well, what are you gonna do? You have to take our money. If you don't take our money, your company's gonna go under. And I stood up and I got my bag and I said, thanks very much, but I'll take that chance. And I walked out. You always have that choice. If you get through the process and you're not sure, then don't do it. I have had bad angels. Honestly, there are some out there. Most of them are fantastic. They are lovely people. They are mostly entrepreneurs themselves. But if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. One of my uh, co-angels says that when he's running through the process, again, this word that you've heard a lot from me, but what he's only interested in through this entire process is monitoring your traction. So he says he invests on these criteria, traction, 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 and beer. Now, I don't drink beer, so this is not my motto, but this is his. Now, what he means by this is that he during this time, we'll make sure that he goes out on a Friday night for a beer or two. Again, to really learn about you. Just keep asking about the traction, subscriber numbers, but really wanting to know the person. So do keep that in mind as well. All the way through the process, you're still selling. Okay, a couple more points, and then we're almost done. It is your responsibility to manage the process. If I haven't drilled at home yet, do not expect anybody else to do it. The angels won't do it for you. They won't, they, you know, it is really your process to manage the lawyers, mar, man, uh, manage the Dropbox and the DD process, pull all the different angels in, make sure that you know where everything is. You need to really call on your project management skills to get this done. We've discussed relationships. Make sure you don't damage them through the process. If you feel that you're working too hard and things are getting out of control, because obviously when closing financial rounds that can happen, take a step back. Don't ring your investors. Don't do anything crazy. Don't get on Twitter. Just take a step back and take a few hours out or a day out and then get back into it. And then uh, also just watch the mo momentum. Try not to aim to close deals in July or August or Easter or Christmas. Again, angels are high net worth. Mo many of them have second homes and, and families and other things that they do. They go skiing at Christmas. They uh, you know, take Easter off to be with the kids and they, they are away you know, in Spain or France in August. So don't, don't close your deals in those months. You'll totally lose momentum. Post deal, just a few points. The investment agreement, people often say, you sign the investment agreement, you get the money and then you put the agreement in the bottom of the drawer, never to be referred to again. I would suggest that you, before you put it in the bottom drawer, that you make very sure that you know, you really understand it and you know what your responsibilities are. It is your job post deal to manage the angels by giving them the periodic information they need and making sure that you carry on with a really great relationship with them. So do make sure you know that. Make sure you communicate with them a lot and make sure that relationship stays strong. Post deal, we angels often expect, we don't like it, but we do expect a couple of things to go a bit wonky after the deal. We try and do good DD, but sometimes some things happen. If there is gonna be failure, often I've mentioned it does happen in the management team, but if there is gonna be something, it normally emerges in the three to six months afterwards. And my advice to you would be to fix it fast. 
whatever it is, whatever you know about now in your company that makes you feel uneasy or causes you sleepless nights, just fix it. It is within your power to fix. That is true before the deal is closed and it's more important afterwards because investors won't put up with failure that doesn't get fixed. We know that things aren't always going to be perfect. We do expect you to fix it. And just remember the exit. Without an exit for the angels, it's charity. So the reason that you've got angel investment is because they want you to grow a successful business, build lots of profit, sell it, and be magnificently wealthy and successful yourselves. And they'll get a bit of the glow from that as well. So focus from the outset at the exit. There is nothing like an exit. I know I should say that the best day the best days of my life are the days that my three sons were born, but that's not true. <laughs> it's the day I've sold companies. That's unbelievable. It's a wonderful feeling. So focus on that. Hold that as your objective, and good luck to you all. Some more questions on any of that? Or are you a bit angeled out? Got one chap over here. We've got a mic. Thank you, Ben. Hi there. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the exit because um, as an investor, uh, normally you, you look at, you know, uh, I don't know, mid-term plan, uh, the company grows, everything is go, goes, goes great. And then you want to, to have an exit, obviously, and making money on the, on the process. Um, at that stage, normally uh, the founders of the the owners of the company is buying you your share, or because or you are selling the company to a bigger company, and then you get your share from that. I don't know how how it works that part. In almost every case, it's the latter. Normally, it's a trade sale, but often the founders do stay. So, taking my company as a case in point, I sold my company actually after. Uh, my first exit was after three years. So we'd reached profit. I think we had about 100 million of sales. We still knew there was an uptick there, but my angels could see that they'd own. I think the angels had been in for between 18 months and 24 months, so quite a short time. They could see there was a trajectory, and they thought, great, we'll, we'll take some cash back now, thank you very much, and spend it on other startups. So what we did was we, um, the whole company was sold, but, and so the, the angels got their, their return, but the founders stayed on with the new company, and I actually became CEO of the new company, and we, we actually got, we vested, all our, rolled up all our shares into that and bought a part of that, and then I sold that company two years later to an American business, um, First Data Corporation. So that is often what happened, but you can do it anyway. I mean, the, I think the most important thing what I do now with all of my entrepreneurs, before I put the money in, is I ask them to write me a one paragraph statement of their exit intent. And that's really interesting. When you, if you actually write down what you think you would like to do in terms of exit, and it can be, you know, I want to sell in five years time, once I've got to 50 million pounds of revenue, and I expect to sell in a trade sale, I don't want to have anything to do with the business after that, I just want to then go away and spend my money. That's really important because there might be your co-founder might say, no, I love this product. I'm never going to sell it. I always want to be involved. I know everybody else might sell, but I, I really always have to be working with the product. So even the fact of writing it down actually really gets people talking about it. Um, and, and equally, then it informs the angel how committed you really are to the exit. <laughs> Would you invest in a company that's a competitor that's oil already in your portfolio? No. All right. I wouldn't even talk to a company who is a competitor in my portfolio. So I had a situation exactly this recently where a wire um, cohort company is in direct competition with one of my portfolio companies. And I didn't think it was, and, and they wanted to, to talk to me to get some advice on something. And I didn't think that was right. Um, because I know too much about the market and I would only be wanting them 
to not do as well as my portfolio company. So I didn't think that was, that was right. So no, I wouldn't do that. What I have tried to do, and when you get a portfolio of 10, 20 businesses, you can begin to do this, is have a portfolio thematic. And, port and I've got a couple of companies in my portfolio where they're in the same um, chain. They're vertically integrated. That's really cool when you can begin to plug the companies together. That, that's nice. All right, thank you. <laughs> any more for any more? Lovely. Hi, Dale. Um, my name's Cameron Church. I work with uh, Knox Media Hub, which is a Wera uh, company out in Barcelona. Great, um, well done. Thank you. My cohort is over here as well. So. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the challenges I think we have is the team is based in Barcelona, mm -hmm. but one of the primary markets is, for example, Britain and the US. Mm. So we're, we work in digital media um, in terms of the premium video on demand industry. And I just, from an angel investment perspective, does location come into it for you guys when it comes to your due diligence? Do you care where the team is based uh, geographically? Do you, does that enter your risk profile at all? So it's Friday night and you've been working hard all week and you need to stop focusing on your business. It's time to have some fun, let your hair down. And you decide you want to go out and meet the woman of your dreams. And you want to meet someone who is gorgeous and Spanish probably and really bright. I'm not looking at your wedding ring. This is all hypothetical. You can dream for a moment. Really smart. Would you go to the bar where you know women like that go to? Or would you go with your mates to the pub around the corner for a pint? Go always where your customer, <laughs> client, partner, or otherwise would be, I would suggest. I think it's very important. Sales is one thing. Actually, I probably haven't focused on it enough. Selling, or maybe I have, I don't know. Selling is, is vital. That you do not have a business, I think, until you have a revenue stream. You cannot get a revenue stream until you get contracts or, or customers and traction on your subscriber numbers. You can't get that until you are with your community, with your customer base, building relationships, talking to them, understanding them, uh, interacting with them. I think it is much, much more difficult. So I, I would be careful. I would think about that more. I mean, it obviously depends on the sector. It depends on your marketplace, but um, and, and on the product offering and what have you. But I think very much you've got to go where your customers are. You've got to talk to them, understand them, know what they like. And congratulations on your marriage. <laughs> Hi, Dale. So just a trivial one. So um, where do you hang out on Friday night then? <laughs> <laughs> where do you go to? <laughs> it's very difficult, isn't it, to find out where an angels hang out. I'm sure you can find out where, where lots of angel networks are and then lots of conferences. Actually, you can find out where um, angels are speaking. If you, if you Google, again, go through your LinkedIn network, look for the angel um, in the uh, job title, and then you can find out these People like me, you know, do give the odd talk. They sit on panels. They'll judge pitching competitions. So I'm sure you can find them that way. <laughs> Hello, Dale. Hi. Um, do you have like a sort of like minimum revenue that you expect a company to make after a certain amount of years for you to look at that company seriously? Um. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think the opportunity has to excite you. So, I mean, it's subjective. It's different for everybody. Um, but for me, I mean, it's got to be chunky, right? After a few, after a few years of go, it, well, it depends. The first couple of years, I know normally with technology-enabled businesses, you're pretty much, you know, head down, you know, working on the tech. So I wouldn't expect much then. But if you have been trading for a while, if you've actually been, you know, building your revenue line, I would expect you know a few hundred thousand pounds of annual turnover to beginning to come through. That that's that's really exhibiting that you have a, a, a business that you have something that you can really wrap your arms around. Okay, thanks. Yep. yep. Ready for that? Uh, so which? I don't know, Simon. Um, we're going to have um, a sort of a rare treat. Um, I think, which is which is a fantastic angel and a fantastic um, VC. Um, 
and they're going to have uh, some sort of questions and a, a, a wee bit of dialogue about sort of the difference between angels and VCs. Now, I think <coughs> there are questions in the audience that anyone is burning to ask around VCs and the differences, or do we just want to have a sort of a nice little guided conversation by me about the differences? It's entirely up to you. It's what's what's more useful. We are going to do, I just, what a surprise that you've asked that question, sir. Um, we are going to do some very, very quick stand-up elevator pitches to them. Um, but that's super, super quick. Um, and what we'll ask them to do is kind of a very quick thumbs up, thumbs down. You know, what do you see a problem to be? Now, I know Simon quite well. Simon's very, very analytical. Um, and he likes to see his... Well, you like your numbers, don't you? You're a data geek. That's fair. Um, so, I mean, obviously, this is a little bit practice rather than real, but I think we will we'll do that for sure. Um, I don't really know how to, to start this off. Would you, you want to kind of... Well, well, actually, I wonder if I could ask a question, because I'm, I'm worried now <laughs> that I've, been, I've done this presentation and then there's this VC standing off stage. He's probably thinking, that's rubbish. I didn't hear uh, any of it, by the way. Oh, so good, yeah, so he safe. can't <laughs> disparage me. Um, but I, well, I wonder, Simon, if you think that VCs um, invest in any way differently than angels, do you? Um, I think the world is changing. So historically, angel investment has been separate from venture investment. Um, uh, and that's because uh, the amount of money that angels can work with is, is limited and the amount of money that venture capital funds are in the tens and hundreds of millions. So you know, if we're trying to turn 100 million into 500 million, we have to find different sorts of companies. And if you're an angel trying to turn... 100,000 into 500,000. So um, we've been in he's different worlds. He's telling you that he's much, much richer than me. So <laughs> It's not my money. The diff well, the other thing is it's also not my money and it's your money. So uh, there's yeah. a much more personal connection in angel investing. But what, what, what is changing dramatically in the last year, particularly in the UK with changes with EIS uh, schemes uh, and, and in, in Silicon Valley, is that angels are clubbing together and putting more money to work as syndicates. And so they're becoming small VCs. Uh, and we uh, are working much more closely together now. And we, I'd say our most active investor group now are angel syndicates. Mm. So the, uh, uh, five years ago, angels and VC very different. Today, much more aligned. Um, I think we are trying to build uh, equally big businesses together. Um, so it, it's, it's quite different. Um, but today, I think there's much more alignment of interests. Um, it, because an angel is personally invested, they might take a more personal interest. But uh, as a VC, we only invest in things that we understand where we can add value. So we, um, we want to work with companies that we're excited about and we can get passionate about and we have an interest as well. So there's, there's a lot more commonality than differences, I think, these days. I talked in my talk a lot about traction the need for traction, and the quality of the team. There's many other things that we would look for in a great investment, but I think those two kind of top my list. Yep. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think um, obviously um, there are thousands of great ideas in the world. And what, one of the things that people have to understand is that small businesses are fantastic. 99% of the businesses in Europe are SMEs. Um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with a 20 employee small business that has a wonderful customers, a great culture, but it doesn't generate enough profit to satisfy shareholders or banks. But that's the majority of businesses in Europe, and they're wonderful things. And I think we should be very proud of anybody that creates a wonderful small business where everybody's happy. Occasionally, though, some of those small businesses, if you put some extra money in, could grow to be very big businesses. And that's what we're looking for. It's, it's the wonderful little businesses today with the right investment that can become the big businesses of tomorrow. And the, the one way you can really screw up a nice, beautiful little business is to give it a lot of money and force it to try and do something when the market's not there or the team's not ready. So venture capitalists can screw up really good businesses. I don't think people should be out trying to build big business for the sake of it. We should be trying to build beautiful businesses. Um, now, I, I read something recently, I think that's very interesting, I do agree with you on that. I read something recently, uh, the research is a little bit old, it's two or three years old, that suggested that uh, startups that got VC investment took 10 years longer on average to get to exit than angel-backed businesses. So purely angel-backed businesses were out within about three to five years and VCs were much, much longer. Can you tell us why that is and, talk, uh, and do you agree with that? Yeah, I think we, um, because we uh, are trying to turn hundreds of millions into you know, billions of dollars of return, 
our companies, when we want to sell them, generally we want to IPO or sell over $100 million of value. So we're trying to build big business. That just takes time. Google took uh, six years, uh, no, sorry, Google took five years to get to a billion dollars revenue. Facebook took six years to get to a billion dollars revenue. I invested in Cambridge Silicon Radio in 99. They invented Bluetooth. It took them seven years to get to a billion dollars revenue. And we IPO'd it uh, after about five years. We held our stock and after seven years, we made a lot of money. But you can't build he billion dollar businesses. He's definitely richer than me. <laughs> <laughs> you can't build uh, billion dollar businesses overnight. And what, what's fascinating is when a big business suddenly appears, people say, wow, that seemed to have happened quickly. And people don't see the fact that all of these businesses nearly go bust. Google, Facebook, and Cambridge Silicon Radio all had emergency financing uh, problems. The board meetings where we were, had the, everybody had the uh, administrators in. Are we going to fund it again? Is it going to go bust? You yeah. know, payroll, can we make it? Every company in yeah. the world goes through that. And yeah. it takes years and years and years. I think one of the beautiful things about being an angel investor is you can put some money in and you can go along the journey a little bit after a year or two. You have some optionality. When I put a lot of money in a company, I has to, it's kind of go big or go home. Um, you don't want to give up and you keep trying. As an angel uh, and, and the entrepreneur you back, you can decide after you, okay, well maybe the business is now worth 10 million. That's enough for all of us and we can then hand it on to somebody else or find a bigger parent for it to be in. So there's a lot more perhaps optionality in the angel route than the kind of go big or go home mentality that we kind of look for. I think that's very interesting. Perhaps that's something you might want to think about with your DD, with your angels, is asking them if they have had an experience with one of their portfolio companies where things have gone bad and getting them to talk through with you what happened and how they felt about it. Because some angels do get, they get very attached to their companies and they get very upset when things go wrong. <laughs> and others have been around the block a while and have been to a few creditors meetings and uh, you know, that's all just part, part of the game really. Um, I think it might be worth just sort of talking a little bit, Simon, about your career as an investor. I mean, you mentioned CSR there, which is a hugely successful firm. I saw you react to that idea. People do forget the CSR invented Bluetooth. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of your experiences with Love Film and obviously uh, DFJ's involvement in a company that I was working at, uh, at Tap2, and, and sort of compare and contrast a little bit the sort of the differences. Uh, one was very successful and the one I worked with wasn't very successful. Um, where do I start? I mean, we, uh, as DFJ globally, we've invested in all sorts of businesses. In Europe, we've backed some amazing companies like Love Film and Grays uh, and the ones you mentioned. Globally, we have been investors in um, uh, Tesla, Skype, SpaceX, Baidu. Um, uh, so we, you know, we got in the A, and we tend to be A, B round investors. So uh, quite a lot of A rounds, quite a lot of B rounds. And um, our average investment globally is about five, $10 million. Um, the, what's, what's, what's great is to talk about the successes. Um, we have 600 portfolio companies, and we haven't had 600 successes. Um, and the, the truth is, uh, there's a lot more fail in it, failure than, than success. Um, but this is a long-term game, and you need the success to pay for the failures. Uh, and you never actually know. Um, you know. One of the things that surprises me is when you make your investments, you, you, you're absolutely certain when you invest it's going to be a winner. And then something <laughs> happens, and actually the one that you think is going to be a, a turkey actually turns out to be the winner. So you never really know because so um, markets change, the world changes, different things happen. So what we look for when we back a team is, an, uh, is somebody with passion and knowledge of what they're trying to do. You know, we can add a CFO, we can have a CEO, we can, you can hire executive skills to execute. But what you want at the heart of a business is a passionate entrepreneur who understands his market, not because he has the perfect solution and he's going to ram, ram that solution home to the customers, because he can watch the market evolve. And as the market changes, he'll react and come up with a new product. And I think the key thing about um, a company like Grace, for example, was we started, uh, and if, if you don't know, Grace uh, was the, the CTO team that came out of Love Film. We, uh, we had, or the entrepreneur, uh, Graham Bosch, had this crazy idea of putting healthy snacks in a box and sending them out. And it's been probably our most successful, fastest growing company in the UK, uh, and it's about to launch in America. Um, the first couple of years, that company had a lot of problems. We put fresh fruit in the box, it got squashed, it went off. We had, you know, there's all sorts of problems. And it's only when we actually got the listen to the customer and we started to add a little bit of chocolate and got some ingredients right and we changed and when we listened and we refined the product. So after two years, we got the product right by listening and because Graham was passionate about the consumer. And when we got it right, the virality kicked in and the company exploded. Uh, and so, you know, that, the most important thing for us is somebody who's really passionate about their, their, their market and their product, but can adapt and change. And that, I think that's the, big, the, the biggest success, not picking on any particular company, but when you see a company fail, it's because the team didn't stuck too long 
with their old model and didn't see the world changing and didn't, I had the word pivot is the worst world on the planet, but <laughs> didn't adapt and change to the changing environment. And that's the mark of a good entrepreneur is somebody who sees that ahead of the curve and sure. while they still got money in the bank, adjusts to get back onto a different track. Yeah. So we've got about sort of 10 minutes left before we have to, to exit the stage. I'm wondering who is feeling brave enough to present <laughs> their... We're going to we're gonna 30 seconds, and after 30 seconds, I am going to cut you off, okay? So you have 30 seconds to sum up your business to these fantastic and very, very talented, successful investors. Are you ready? Yeah? What, what, why? 30 seconds. Do we think 30 seconds is long enough? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, right. Okay, my name is um, Paul Peter Karameri. Um, hello, Simon, and hello, Dale. Now, there may be an element of serendipity to this situation because your background, you had a company called Omega Logic, yeah. which was a pioneer in the prepay mobile space. Yeah. My wife and I have just developed a social network um, that's designed to, that, that enables people to swap mobile airtime. It's a, an attempt to apply the crowdsourcing a model to the provision of airtime. So, for instance, if somebody's on pay as you go, and they've uh, run out of their minutes, but they still have text and data, and somebody else is on um, pay-as-you-go and has run out of um, uh, data, mm -hmm. but has minutes, you can swap. So it's an attempt to enable people to essentially uh, put airtime that's idle on their pay-as-you-go tariffs into an exchange wherein they'll be able to swap. And so, so we've developed the um, prototype um, of the platform that does these um, swaps, and uh, uh, we're essentially uh, trying to get to the next stage, get it sort of accelerated and um, uh, invested in, basically. So there we are. Very good. Long way over 30 seconds, but that was fine. What, what do you, what, the challenges, opportunities you can see? The first here? thing that springs to mind is um, the networks, why, why they would um, let you do this. So if I was Vodafone or Orange, um, I have got a network background as well before I started my company. And I just wonder why they would allow you to trade minutes and data. Um, it, it's sort of aimed as a, it's sort of targeted at a younger demographic that may not have the kind of disposable income mm -hmm. that um, others may have, okay? so. So in terms of the value to them, one of the main problems the mobile industry faces is the churn rate. A lot of people are dissatisfied with their tariffs and they just um, hopscotch from network to network to network. So this would be, uh, I guess, some um, positioned as a value added proposition okay. um, that would help with retention. And obviously a retained customer is over time a paying customer. Okay. So that's, uh, there's more okay, research so that my, we need to do. My but, feedback um, is your pitch is very good. Great um, uh, physical um, presence and good diction and good, I got it immediately, which is terrific. I would immediately get, are you in an accelerator program already? Okay, so I, I would look at one because they'll wrap around the care that you need. I'd be thinking about the networks, the whole, their whole business model works on unused, uh, purchased minutes and texts. So you'd be undermining that. And if you could crack it, then great. But I, I'd get into an accelerator and get the model more developed from, from those points of view. Yeah, so I think there's a whole raft of opportunities around reinventing business models. There, there, uh, there's other, for example, there's other people at the moment trying to uh, allow you to put unused airline tickets to create liquidity where you can't change, you know, the airlines charge you a fortune if you want to change your flight. Put that into a liquidity pool, it creates a wonderful uh, opportunity. There's thousands of opportunities like that. So you're coming at it from a customer point of view, which is a customer problem. Here is a solution. The challenge is uh, twofold. One is the, the legal system of all the big incumbents who actually make their money from those breakages and from all of that, you know, those, the, they put those rules in place to maximize profits, not to maximize customer satisfaction. So you have, you can launch these things, even like Airbnb launched and then it suddenly finds that, you know, that the, the cities and the hotel regulation is coming down on them. So beware of the regulatory framework and the incumbents. But if you can get enough if you can find a way through that, and if you can get a virality into your business so that you get word of mouth and you get people on board, if you get big enough, then you might be able to win. If you take a look at Spotify, you know, the idea that you can actually make money from uh, the margins of Spotify are so low, they have to get so big, but they ultimately become a valuable company. The margins in what you're doing are so low that it, you have to become really, really big and you have to win, otherwise it won't work. So there's, there's a huge amount of opportunity in what you're doing. There's lots of challenges, regulatory and incumbents, and you need to find a way of getting them on board or working through that. But if you can then find 
something customers really get value from and you can get them to talk about it amongst themselves and you get some kind of customer acquisition model at low cost, it will fly and become, uh, you know, a low margin business can be a huge business. Um, so th there's lots of opportunities around that sort of model which are emerging now. Um, they're not easy, but definitely worth pursuing. I think that's superb advice. Now all you need to do is find an accelerator that's somehow linked to a, a sort of large multinational um, no telecoms firm. Yeah. If, if anyone sees one around here, please let me know. Um, we've got about sort of five minutes left. Um, does anyone wish to try their own pitch against? Oh, I'm loving, I'm loving the enthusiasm yeah, here. This yeah, is fantastic. Very good. <laughs> thank you. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Simon. Hi, Dale. I'm Linda Thomas, and I'm the founder and CEO at See My Event. So, See My Event is a online hub um, targeting the event industry, and it's very much about the private events industry for anyone trying to um, to organise their wedding, organise their bar mitzvah. Uh, we know the market is very fragmented, and it's a big it's a big massive market that we're sort of tackling here with lots of uh, small to medium enterprise players and as a customer or as a user when you're trying to organize your um, your wedding your bar mitzvah it takes about 18 months to do and you're pulling your hair out so what we're aiming to do is to make it a seamless customer experience to find the right suppliers um, and organize well and communicate with a number of suppliers in a seamless way. So all the notepads, iPads, phones, emails, we're gonna put it all into one place, into one hub. So you can so it's an online place, you can find and you can communicate with those suppliers and you can share um, was it you can share the decision making process with your aunts from America or you know your families. Because I think that's a big part as well. And that's what we aim to try and do. Very good. That sounds great. Lovely uh, presentation. Thank you very much. And well Thank done you. for standing up. It's yeah. not easy. Um, that's good. I think, there, again, there's some very interesting models uh, around this. There are obviously boards like Pinterest and what have you that help with the whole idea of collaboration and decision making and sharing ideas, which is terrific. I've also got one portfolio company which, which does a similar thing to you, not, not in, in events, but the whole idea of having a hub or a platform which goes off and gets some um, quotes, actually, from mm -hmm. for all the different elements of a, I imagine to, to have a wedding. You must need, I can't remember, mine was so long ago, but you need lots and lots of different services and elements yes. that you bring together. So if you can really bring that in and make it easier for the person putting the event on, I think that sounds very interesting because you've got to, you've got to, to uh, engineer away the complexity for the customer in order it to be valuable for them. Then you can take a, a small margin on the, on the way through, which could be valuable. I think um, it's an interesting time to think about those models. The, the reality is something like a wedding or a moment, so you do once in your life, hopefully, maybe twice. Um, and um, so you're not thinking about it all the time. And when you do something, you tend to want a trusted supplier. So you tend to go to where you get trust, which is your, your networks, which aren't online yet. It's starting to change. But normally people would ask, who else organized their friend's wedding? And, and so you have a lot of local fragmented suppliers because networks and trust are physical still. With social networks coming on board, you're starting to see that trust move online. So things like Facebook are the platform that allow you to try and piggyback on that change in society where trust can be shared online and you'll trust the recommendation from your Facebook page. It's, we're at the early days of that. It's only just starting to happen. Some of the surveys, certainly younger people, um, so maybe if you go for the, uh, the sub-25 market in marriages, um, people are starting to trust a lot online. We're, we're doing a lot of work in digital health, looking for people doing sort of things there. Because at the moment, people trust their GP or their friends, or, uh, but their friends don't have the same conditions. And we're seeing people starting to trust the internet and social networks much more about different sorts of advice. So it's early days, it will be coming. Uh, you know, it, the challenges are um, you know, people really have to have faith and trust in you. And uh, that's quite a difficult thing to build um, you know, without some huge, traditionally huge brand marketing campaign, which would, you know, be very difficult to, to achieve. But with social networking platforms, you might be able to find a way through that. Yeah, and it's uh, something that we're utilizing completely. I agree. It's the Facebook and the, um, the social media that we need, you know, it's, it's part of the, the, the sharing experience. Um, but again, to that, it was, you know, it came out from a really frustrating exercise. And it's, it's about, well, I recently planned my own wedding. And I think when you're trying to juggle your job um, along with the wedding planning, and wedding planning takes about 18 months, Gosh. you know, on average, it's just insane. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. that's got to be disintermediated, I would have thought. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Very good.
Anyone else feeling brave enough? You, excellent. No, no, okay. No, anyone? <laughs> oh, good man. You ready? Hi, I'm Thomas, and I'm founder of Remote Assistant. It's a mobile app for blind people to let them use eyes of someone else remotely. So by sharing video stream from their smartphones and their location in real time, the assistants can help them. So they can help get help either from their friends for free or from professional assistant service, which is a paid thing. And uh, as a follow-up question, uh, we are in a viral accelerator. And uh, we get the feedback that the investors would like to see us to get um, bigger target groups because obviously uh, this is a niche, niche market. So, and we know that if we only go for blind people, uh, already governments are giving a lot of money uh, to, for associations that are helping blind. So we can uh, work with them to get the money. So how would you tell this to investors to you know, convince them that this is a real deal? I think one of the, uh, to my point earlier, um, there are 10 million SMEs in Europe. Um, the number of venture deals in Europe that raise more than 3 million pounds is 200 companies across the whole of Europe in all sectors. Right. So 10 million, 200. Uh, the, so uh, that raise venture, in terms of raising small venture rounds, uh, uh, it's about seven, 800 companies. My point is there are many ways to fund a company. If you have a customer need, and it sounds like a, a very uh, good you know, thing that you're providing, there are real customers, there are real need. Investment isn't necessarily the only way to fund that business. You know, there are government grants, there are customers, there are prepayments. There's a million ways to get cash into a business, to build a great business, not necessarily with investment, angel investment or VC investment. I, I, I would really stress the importance of thinking about a, investment is something you bring in when you have a good business that you really want to accelerate. Investment isn't something you necessarily bring in to build a business. There's lots of ways to build businesses with lots of, and, and what you're doing is very noble and very good and there will be lots of different ways to think about bringing money in. It, the, so, you know, the 10 million SMEs in Europe, they're all working on different niches, but they're all great businesses and they're all good, um, but they're not good investments. And there's a big difference between a great business and a great investment. Uh, and I, you, just, you need to really understand that as an yeah, entrepreneur. The reason for the investment is that it takes time to get the funding from governments if we right. work with the partners, yeah? So right. until that time, we'll, we'll probably still need uh, one more investor to, you know, get through that point. So, so maybe there are uh, charitable organizations, maybe there are, you know, there's a, uh, you may, uh, I don't know the exact use cases, but if you think about the problem you're solving, maybe the, maybe um, people who are, have think something they want to sell to your customers will work with you and do some revenue share. There's, there's just a million ways that you can create uh, income streams or cash flows in other than investment. Um, that, I'm not saying give up on investment, I'm just think, trying to get you to think creatively about lots of different ways to get that business up and running. Okay, um, thank you. Well, guys, I think that's been a fantastic session. Um, unfortunately, we have to depart the stage, but I think please join me in thanking um, both Dale and uh, Simon there. Thank you very much, guys. Thank very you. Very welcome. Very welcome. Um, I think there was quite a lot to take into that session. It's quite hard to sort of wrap it all up, um, but I think the point that Simon makes it kind of really highlights the whole session for me, which is there is a big difference between your great business and what an investor thinks is a great investment. And sometimes that can be really hard to learn because all you want to do is change the world or employ your friends and create the, the company you've always wanted to work at. And that doesn't mean that it's investable. And that's a very hard lesson to kind of, I think, sometimes <laughs> learn and realize is that some of your ideas just aren't worth anything to an investor. And that way you have to try and find other solutions and other ways to monetize. And that can be very grueling and painstaking. But I think if you follow some of the fantastic advice that we had in this session, you're going to put yourself in a great place. Um, if you want to look at alternative funding streams, please come and join us at 2 o'clock this afternoon where we'll be talking to Jeff Lynn from Cedars and talking about other ways to raise money in this exciting and interesting socially enabled time. So thank you very much, guys. Hopefully see you all again at 2 o'clock.